Hey everyone, welcome back to our third and final session of the day. Uh, we have now with us Akash NS, co-founder of Jovian.ml. It's a really interesting company and uh, Akash can tell you more about what they do. Thank you so much for being here with us, Akash. And uh, over to you. Okay, thanks, Ariman. Uh, hey everyone, thanks a lot for joining. Also, uh, so I will be conducting the masterclass today on data science uh, for the data science and AI track. Um, I know you've probably already spent maybe a, about a, a week or a couple of weeks already working on your problem statements. Uh, so I've tried to structure this talk uh, more from the perspective of what it might uh, look like for you as a participant and uh, my process on how I would go about uh, building something and what are the different techniques I would use in the process. So um, what we'll do is I'm just going to share my screen and I, I, I hope you can see my presentation here. Please give me a thumbs up if you can see my presentation. All right, great. So what we'll do is uh, I will. Okay, let's just let's jump right in. I'll start with a basic overview of the account aggregator platform itself. And then I'll talk about a few uh, use cases and problems that we can address. Uh, if you have questions, you can keep posting them in the chat or in the questions box. Uh, so what we will do is we'll spend about 30, 40 minutes just going through the presentation and you can just keep typing on your questions and then we'll take some questions at the end and I'm available at the end of on this live stream and also probably on the speaker on the lounge tables so we can have a conversation there too. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so a quick introduction about myself. I am Akash. Uh, Akash Anas on Twitter. I am the co-founder and CEO of Jovian.ml. Uh, we are a, a data science and AI company. I'll talk a little more about that. Uh, before this, I've been an ex-software engineer at Twitter in uh, Ireland and in the US. And then I hold a computer science degree from IIT Bombay. And apart from what my full-time job, I like to just write code blog. So I do a lot of open source, do a lot of blogging, and also try to teach uh, whenever I find time. Now, a, a little bit about Jovian.ml. So Jovian.ml is a sharing and collaboration platform for data science projects and Jupyter notebooks. So this is, uh, it is a, it's, think of it like GitHub for data science and machine learning. Um, if we make it really simple for you to share any data science project that you're working on, any analysis, any models, any, um, you know, any machine learning work that you're doing, you just use a couple of, uh, you install a library and add a couple of sentences into your, a couple of code lines into your Jupyter notebooks, and then you can share them online. You can visit our website, jovian.ml to learn more. Let me just grab that. Yeah. So you can visit our website, jovian.ml um, to learn more about what Jovian is. Okay. So a quick overview of what we'll discuss today. So we will start with, well, first, why uh, the account aggregator platform is uh, an important platform. What problems does it solve? Uh, then we will uh, go over an overview of the account aggregator architecture. Uh, this will be very quick because there's already been a uh, multiple technical overviews as far as uh, I, I have seen. Um, then just talking about some of the problems that account aggregator addresses and bringing them to ideas for projects leveraging data science and AI because that's what you're doing, right? And during these ideas, I will go into various levels of depth, try to point you to what, how I would approach a certain problem and what are the resources that I would refer to. I've also linked to a few resources and I think the slides are available online as well. So you will be able to access all of this. And finally, I wanna share with you some tips for creating a winning project because uh, I want the data science and AI track to win all the prizes. Okay, so why account aggregator? A simple way to think of it, why would the problem that, that is being addressed is something like this. Now, as an individual, I have my financial information in a lot of different places. And uh, sometimes it's even hard for me to tell, okay, how much money do I actually have? What are my assets? What are my liabilities? And then, God forbid, if I have to apply for a loan, I have to go to maybe, I don't know how many websites whose passwords I've forgotten or maybe visit actual bank branches, which are no longer in the same city that I'm living in. So any anything related to, uh, to your financial information is really hard to work with. And that is where the account aggregator comes into picture. 
So I want to dig a little bit deeper on three specific problems that the uh, AA platform solves. So the first is that your financial data is fragmented across many sources. So you have your bank accounts, your payment wallets, you have your credit cards, you have your loan accounts, you have your insurance policies, you have your fixed deposits, mutual funds, DMAT account, equity, commodities. And each of these is either a physical establishment or a website that you have to go to. You have to remember username, you have to remember a password, you have to get some OTPs, you have a, a phone number attached uh, with each of these. So if you just want to get a quick overview of what are, what are your savings, you don't really have a good place to do that. Right. So that is one. It, it's an it's a huge problem. Uh, it, it's a it's a unique problem to the current era, the digital era, because what happened, let's say before nine before 2000 is everybody would have a folder inside that folder. They would have their insurance policy. They would have their bank passbook. They would have maybe a one or two other things and all the documents would be available for you to review. But now it's no longer the case. So this overhead needs to be solved. And that's one problem uh, the account aggregator is addressing. Then the second thing is that, you know, we're all about fintech. We're all about enabling people, uh, bringing them into the financial system. But fintech today faces a huge bottleneck of manual processing, right? Uh, so what you have to do is, let's say if you're applying for a, a loan, you have to submit uh, a printed, you, you probably are going to get bank statements from your bank signed, and then you're going to send it over and somebody has to then manually go through it and digitize it. Uh, and that makes it really difficult to give smaller loans. Or if you send, if you download something from your net banking, then you either have a PDF uh, and then parsing a PDF is a whole pain in itself, or you have spreadsheets, but then every bank has a different format. And then there are so many different formats to be uh, solved. So th this ends up re requiring a lot of manual processing or a lot of manual development. And because of this, you know, if you want to give out a thousand rupee loan, the cost of processing the loan itself is probably going to be more than thousand. And that is the reason you don't see loans of thousand rupees happening. Right. And uh, um, the other option that people have come up with is to ask for users credentials and then scrape your net banking account, which is a huge privacy concern because giving your credentials basically gives access to pretty much everything. And you might not want to do that with every other uh, with every service provider that you're working with. And then finally, even if you go through all these steps, it is very difficult to it's a one time exercise and it's a cost to it. So it's very difficult to do on a recurring basis. It's time consuming. It's difficult. It is error prone. These systems have to be changed on a on a on a very regular basis. Right. So that's one. That's the second uh, issue, the bottleneck of manual processing. And then finally, one probably this is where it really hits home is that the access to credit is limited due to the lack of financial data, right? So uh, if you imagine the uh, a large part of the economy is actually either running on cash or running on small transactions, right? Whether it's a grocery store or a, a somebody selling something on a, um, let's say on a Tela or on the street side. So even though they've started accepting payments, uh, it's not easy to take that transaction history and then give it to somebody else and then get a loan on basis on, on based on that transaction history and so on. Right. So there is no income or transaction history that can be easily shared, easily viewed. Um, you cannot. And that because of that, it is very difficult to determine credit worthiness. And even for a, like a thousand rupee loan, it's hard to tell whether this person is credit worthy or not. And then. Once the loan is given, there is no mechanism to track the spending. Is the is the amount being spent in the right ways or not? And finally, the recollection of the loans can be a nightmare as well, because um, well, there are no automated processes set up to do it. So, so these basically are three problems that the account aggregator solves. There are a bunch more, but I just want you to think about these three. The first one being uh, just being able to access all your financial information in one place. The second one being able to share your financial information with the service provider easily. And then the third is to provide credit based on uh, the financial transaction information or any other information that might be available. Okay. And this is where the account aggregator program uh, platform comes into picture where it takes all of your information across many different platforms, across many different uh, companies, makes it accessible to you on your phone and gives you the ability to give consent for others to be able to access and view and maybe act upon that uh, information, right? So that's how it solves all of these problems. Now let's just go over and 
uh, oh, let's just go over the account aggregator architecture and framework and what it looks like. Again, this is very brief, not going into a lot of detail here. So I think that you've probably seen a bunch of pictures on this, but probably the one I find the most simple is the end user experience. So from the end user experience, you have a data source, you have a bunch of places where you have your data sitting, and then you want to access some service. So you have the data source is called a FIP or a financial information provider. And then the access, the service that you want to access needs some financial information. So they are the financial information user. So what you do is you install an account aggregator app. So one of these apps, and then the, and then what you can do is the financial information user can request some information via the app and you can review the request. You can review exactly which fields of data they need from which particular financial information users they need it and simply swipe to share the information, right? Just enter an OTP or something and share the information. And that is a really, really powerful way to do something that currently requires a huge a number of manual processes, both on your end and on the end of the service provider on the end of the person who the custodian of the data, which is the FIP. And then this is a, what the technical architecture looks like. I'm sure you're probably probably familiar with it at this point that there is a certain consent flow uh, by which. So what happens, roughly speaking, is the financial information user uh, needs to request some information. So it requests consent. Once the consent is sent, that consent is sent to the financial information provider. Then there is a data request that is made. So then you request some data from the financial information provider and then the financial information provider sends back the data to the account aggregator in an encrypted format. And then from the account aggregator, that data is sent to the uh, financial information user in the uh, encrypted format. And finally, the financial information user decrypts that data safely. Only the data that you have granted consent for and it is the data is already in a machine readable format. So they can do the processing on the data and then they can give you a loan or uh, issue your visa or maybe complete your, give you your insurance price or things like that, right? So that's the technical architecture. And uh, this is a very, uh, it's, it's a, the framework first of all has a fantastic design and it supports many different types of financial information. So it is not just that it is going to give you a single API to access all your bank accounts. It's actually a lot more. It's a single API, a single interface to access your bank, all different bank accounts, um, credit cards, uh, insurance policies, mutual funds, any uh, DMAT accounts, any uh, stocks, shareholding you might have. So all of that can actually be pulled in using the same API in a machine readable format, which is very consistent. And that this, this is done using JSON APIs. So you have these JSON API endpoints where you basically uh, first get consent from the user and then using a token or the consent token, you request some information. And finally, what the, the information that comes back to the financial information user or the FIU is something like this. It's simple JSON. And in this JSON, you have this encrypted financial information. So all the, all the way through, there is a, there is a second layer of encryption, which prevents anybody in between from seeing your data. And finally, the financial information user can use that, decrypt that and uh, use that data. Okay. So I'm talking about all this because we are talking about data science and AI. And finally, you know, all this is well and good in terms of the engineering, but we need the data so that we can start working with that data. Right. And that is where, um, the raw data comes into picture. So this is what the raw data looks like. You have the, the raw data is actually in XML format. I, I assume there are probably other formats as well. And uh, if you're like me, if you're a developer, then you're probably not very used to the XML format. You're probably more used to JSON. But fortunately, it's very easy to convert this XML into JSON. You know, you can just write some simple code or you can just uh, use an online converter. So for instance, what I have here is uh, one Let's say this is the data pulled from a bank account. I have a bank account in SBI. So I have granted consent for uh, one month of data from SBI. And uh, this data has been pulled by the FIU. So financial information users. So they get my account. They get maybe the uh, profile. They get the list of holders. So these are the uh, account holders. It could be a joint account. It could be a single account. They get a summary of my current balance. Like um, They get some like whether my account is active. What are the limits of my account if I'm doing if I'm doing a, a overdraft what is the IFSC code MICR code and what is the pending amount that remains processing and finally you have this transactions data 
So here are some transactions from the account. These could be transactions. You can see there's a start date and an end date. So these could be transactions within a week, a month, a year, uh, any duration. Okay. Now, uh, what I would normally do is that I would first take this and I would convert it to JSON. And that looks of, uh, that looks far more familiar. So now we have the account profile holders, the same. Uh, but the data I'm really interested in is this, right? The transactions data. Uh, and then I would probably take this transactions data. I would write a little bit of code and I would convert that into a CSV file. Okay. So you can see here the transaction has a transaction type. It's a credit. Uh, then the, it was done at an ATM. The amount was 20 rupees and the transaction timestamp was such and such. And this was the um, point at which the, the date at which this transaction was sort of accounted for. Right. Uh, and I'm just, I've just taken that and converted that into a table. Now you could, what you could do is you could do this in Excel. You could do this in uh, Google sheets and you could export a CSV. Or if you're writing code, you could simply do this in code, right? Conversion from XML to JSON to CSV. Ultimately, what we want is this kind of data, uh, CSVs that we can process. And once you have this, now you have a lot of data to work with. Now, again, the account ag aggregator framework is still currently sandbox. So you're probably not going to get a lot of live data. But uh, you can try and generate data, fake data, either through some scripts or just use your own bank statements. There are some scripts which will uh, transform them into the right format. And uh, then you can continue on with the XML. Okay. And I'll talk and I'll continue to talk about this as we talk about a use case. So that was the architecture. That is how you get access to the data. Now I want to share a few ideas for uh, projects that can leverage the account aggregator platform especially uh, data science and AI related projects. Okay. And what we'll do is the three problems that we look that we looked at. We'll just see how can we solve those problems. And the idea here is not to tell you that, okay, you should be solving this. You should be building this, but uh, try to look at this as a process of first identifying, okay, what is the problem I want to address? And second, what might the solution for that look like? And then third, how to implement that solution, right? How do I find the right resources to implement that solution? And that's the exercise that I have done here. So the first problem that we saw that was financial data is fragmented across many sources. And the solution is simple that you provide a unified view of all your financial information, right? Give me an app on my phone that can tell me what are the different, uh, well, something like this that can tell me what are the different uh, accounts that I own, what is my net worth right now? So this could be taking not just my deposit accounts, but also my mutual funds and identifying their current value and my stocks and shares and identifying their current value and my uh, other assets like any insurance policies, something that will pay a premium at some, that, that might uh, give me a return at some point, um, anything, right? Any financial information, probably even just, just to add on, maybe also let me add property and assets like gold and things like that. If I have those accounts, I can enter them manually. So just, and this is, by the way, this is a screenshot of an app called Personal Capital. And none of the images in this presentation are created by me. These are all things that I picked up online for reference purpose only. Um, yeah, right. So, so this is what you could create. Create an application, create maybe a, a, a website, and uh, try to give interesting visualizations or interesting insights that, look, you're, you're probably spending too much on food. Um, or maybe if I have a certain goal on uh, spending on travel, you could tell me that, okay, if this is how much you want to set aside for travel, this is how much you will have left, or you might have to cut back on something, right? So there are a lot of interesting ideas that you can try out here. The key idea is uh, the user interfaces and the visualizations and the different ways in which you can combine information from different sources, right? So here, the, the, the way this would work, is this would present a consolidated uh, view of all of these accounts that you're looking at. And what you would need to do is you would need to get the user's consent for each type of account. So the user can keep adding accounts one by one by one. And using that, you can create like a, a consolidated view. Okay. Now, uh, how would I go about doing this? Now, since there's not a lot of financial, not a lot of data that you can get real production data from the AA platform or the sandbox service, what you could do is you could create sample data sets. So I would probably start with my own financial statements from multiple different websites that that will first make me appreciate the pain that it is today. Then I would download those statements. I would then convert it to the CSV format that I just showed you. So going from XML to JSON to CSV. 
and then i would uh, maybe start doing some data visualizations in python or in javascript or any language of your choice and finally you know once i have gotten some sense of okay this information looks interesting this information does not look interesting and it really depends on the customer profile that you're solving for uh, if it for up to me since i know myself the best i would probably build an app for myself so then extrapolating that then we are probably creating for millennials living in cities um and that can and then you can talk to maybe four or five friends and show them your graphs and ask them hey which graph looks interesting to you which what information do you want to know about your finances right and finally create some uh, mock ups for a mobile application or a desktop application okay um so the idea here is first you create a mock up and then first you just see the user experience and then you can start implementing the pieces on the back end to actually populate these graphs all right so here i have some references for things that you can refer to um, to learn if you if you're not very familiar let's say with data visualization i have a data visualization cheat sheet that i've linked here so what this shows you is uh, this shows you a uh, 10 different types of graphs that you can create in python with just a single line of code and this is hosted on jobin.ml so what you can actually do is you can uh, go and just click run here and if you click the run button you will be able to run it on an online platform like uh, there's something called google colab so this is a jupyter notebook where you can type some code and you can see the graphs outputs right here right here right so you can just run this code online you can experiment with it and um, just replace your data here and try to see if you can come up with something interesting so you know with just a few lines of code you can create line charts you can create scatter plots you can create histograms you can create heat maps uh this is pretty interesting so uh these examples are not on financial data but you know the idea is you can take financial data and put it in here you can create a uh, well this is not too relevant you can probably create something like box plots or bar charts right so there's a there's a use case for each one and the use case is also described here uh, for with each uh, with each chart so you can use this as a starting point for trying to create some visualizations then uh, i just looked online i just uh, found a spend analysis somebody had done of their uh, spend over the past year and here is a link that i have for it so yeah uh, so this is something that somebody pulled out a data from the an app called monzo uh, but if you just read through the code what the data contains is the data simply contains a bunch of transactions and then in each transaction there is a created date uh there is a um, month date year whatever it's just a date then there is the amount there is uh, uh the category so that looks pretty similar to this doesn't it so there's a type which is a credit or a debit then you have the amount and the category could be the mode right uh, and then you have the transaction amount and the value date and things like that so uh, then he starts doing some uh, exploratory analysis plotting some charts So this is what it looks like right if you plot all the transactions it seems like a lot of transactions fall within the less than 10 so this is euros so less than 10 euro range so you could do a similar analysis what is the average transaction size that i have um then here is a category wise spend okay it looks like most of the money goes into bills a little bit goes on eating out on transport and then a general expenses maybe you want to increase uh, one of maybe you want to increase your family expenses maybe you want to increase your personal care expenses so this is a good thing that you can showcase um this is like what are the different merchants that you visit so this is also some information that you get from from the account statement and what are the different payment methods you're using probably so this is just to give you uh, just to inspire you a little bit on uh, what you could do um and and you can look for numerous tutorials numerous examples online so i will not go in too deep into this then finally if you also want to get a little more sense of like if you're not familiar with python you want to learn numpy and pandas we do have tutorials for you as well so you can go on jovian.ml/blog so this is our official blog and here we have a series on the basics of numpy and the basics of pandas so these are the libraries that you would be using to do some analysis on your uh, transaction data okay and all of these are also available as runnable code so you can just try them all out online finally so this is all from the back end perspective of what you can build but uh, probably a more interesting thing would be what does what does the user experience feel like so here i've linked to a site called dribble so in dribble i've just searched for personal finance and there are hundreds of these uh, these mockups or screenshots 
where you can get inspiration from. Like this one looks pretty interesting. So this shows you what you've spent this month, what, what are your funds looking like, what were the previous transactions, what are the cards that you have. You know, all of this now becomes possible with the account aggregator. We do not have to pass any SMSs or PDF bank statements or uh, ask users for their credentials. We can get a simple consent and then build all of these beautiful uh, platforms. Okay. All right. So that was use case number one. Now use case number two. So FinTech faces a huge bottleneck of manual processing. Then can you create some middleware, some, some, um, some utilities, some SDKs to simplify data access, right? What do I mean by that? So this is what it, this is what I mean that there is a customer experience, whether they're using a online banking or mobile banking or a FinTech application, or maybe they're sitting at a bank and uh, they're just talking to, they're sitting in a bank and talking to the banker and uh, they're trying to get a loan, right? Uh, now to get that loan, there is a lot of information that has to be taken from the customer. And to get that, uh, and, and then to access that information, a bunch of API requests have to be made to the account aggregator platform, right? Now, where you could sit is you could actually sit somewhere in between where you could add higher level APIs, which uh, uh, sort of hide the implementation details, you know, make sure that you can, you're retrying, you're getting the right information, parsing it in the right format and giving it to the financial information user in the, uh, in the format that they need, right? Or give them tools for requesting information from the customer. A lot of things like this, for instance, uh, like a good example of this would be the QR code that is there for UPI. So the QR code is like a kind of like a middleware of over on top of UPIs and that gets embedded into any customer application. And what now what happens is any UPI app to any UPI app, you can do payment or you can even just take a QR code and uh, use that to collect a payment. So that makes it really easy to scale these services, right? For a lot of people to create applications on top of these APIs. And uh, under the hood, these interface with the account aggregator platform, and then they access whatever financial information provider they need, okay? So one use case here is uh, one scenario is, suppose a customer visits a bank for a loan, and then the banker requests some financial information. Uh, so to request that information, banker has an app. They just put in, okay, I need your uh, bank statements for the last six months. And I also need, if you have any existing loans, I need that information. And if you have any insurance policies, I need that information. And I need all the information on your assets and liabilities for the last six months. Or maybe I don't need all of these. It's a personal loan. I just need your bank statement, right? So I can just, the banker can choose on their app what this looks like and then send a request. And then the customer receives a notification. So then the customer opens up their app, uh, their account aggregator app. And then they look at it and they say, okay, this is all the information that you're asking for. Let me just grant it. Uh, and then the customer grants it, maybe it's a single grant, maybe it's multiple grants, but the idea is now the customer can see, okay, I've granted information for all of these accounts. And then this information is then taken and it is uh, combined. So all from this could be from different data sources, it is combined and then it is shared with the banker in a format that they can immediately act upon, right? So that I'm sitting in front of you, you request, I grant, you get that screen in front of you with all my information and you're like, okay, tick, tick, tick. Hey, uh, I'm not sure about this. Um, can you explain why you have this loan, which you, it seems to be not paid yet. And then I can tell you, no, no, this is actually, there's some issue here and so on, but don't worry about it. I'll pay it. And then the banker clicks stick and then you're granted the loan, right? So to make this happen, what are the things that you could build? And these are all separate ideas. You could build a mobile SDK to simplify data requests. You know, something that simply gives a nice UI where you can pick a financial information type, you can pick the duration, you can uh, then add multiple uh, uh, FI types and you can add multiple FI accounts and then you can send, uh, you can press a send button and that will then make those requests for you on your behalf and give you like a live update of what are all the things that the customer has granted you, right? That is one. And then second, it could also just, uh, it could also cover the logic of actually accessing multiple financial types, multiple FI types from multiple financial information providers, right? All your banks, all your DMAT, all your mutual funds, everything. And then it could also probably set up recurring access because if you're giving a loan, you probably also want to monitor the person's, let's say just their bank balance so that just to get their risk of default. So it could also give a recurring access. It could also give live updates when the bank balance goes beyond a particular value or something like that. Or maybe you just want to track where the money was spent. Right? Something like that. It, maybe it's not being used for some illegal purpose or something that is not authorized. And then finally, 
so these are all different use cases that you can di different pieces of the middleware that you can build. And finally, one interesting thing is to build a data warehouse, right? So now with the creation of the account aggregator, there is going to be a huge explosion in the amount of data that is going to get collected, that is going to get passed through the system. Now the financial information users are going to need places where they can store this data in a scalable format. So maybe just create a data warehouse, which has a tables, you know, just create tables for each of the FI types, create a, a basic admin layer on top of it so that the right person can access the right things, create APIs on top of it so that these, this data can be fed in one, this data can be populated. And second, this data can be fed into uh, other applications and just offer that as a service, right? So all of these are pretty reasonable startup ideas right here. Uh, of course, there's a regulatory factor involved, but you can always try and tie up with somebody who, who has the right access. Um, and yeah, and once you do this, this kind of a flow actually becomes possible and we are not too far away from making this happen. Okay. So these are some ideas for you to work with. And uh, although this coincides a little bit with the middleware and security part, but since like ultimately it is data that is flowing and it is and data access and data governance is actually a big challenge. So anybody who's a data engineer out there, this is a good challenge for you to just build a solution that's really easy to use. Uh, so here again, I have linked to some uh, resources. Like if I were building this, where would I start? So probably I would first try and understand, okay, how do I build a mobile SDK? Like what are some of the best practices that I should follow? So I have a guide here that I should have a simple interface. I should have like, I, like, I should make it easy. I should make it developer friendly. It should, uh, ideally I should have both an Android and iOS SDK. I should handle errors correctly. Um, I should not ask for too many considerations. I should be careful about memory. I should not drain the battery. Uh, so, you know, just, just try and explore how to build a mobile SDK, maybe watch some tutorials online. That's where I would start. Then for actually storing the data, I would probably use, since this is a hackathon, I would use something like a cloud Firestore, which is a flexible, a no SQL, a cloud database. So it's very easy to sign up, very easy to get started. If you have some advanced knowledge and if you have the time, you might maybe, uh, set up something on AWS or Google cloud or Azure or wherever. But in my case, I would probably start here uh, since it has a very simple, it's kind of gives you a backend as a service and an API. Then I would probably check out, okay, how do I build rest APIs that work well for mobile apps and probably check out how do I build simple UIs on Android, right? With a lot of these things, you can, you probably might take three of the boxes and then the fourth one you do not know. So you can just pick up something very quickly and uh, start building on top of it. So this is just for uh, some guides for building a good rest API, some guides for building a, uh, so this is how you can build a simple user interface within Android, within the Android studio application. You do not even have to write a lot of code and you can at least do a little bit of mockup uh, before you start implementing this, right? So that's your middleware. And finally, the third use case, the third problem was access to credit is limited due to a lack of financial data. <laughs> Well, so here's a machine learning challenge. Why, why not try creating a credit model or a credit score based on financial information? So this is, this is one example of where you could, uh, so this is Rajni. Rajni is uh, like the common example that is given for the India stack. So she is, uh, so she sells pakores on the roadside. Uh, and what she does is every day she has to take a loan in the morning to buy the raw materials for her pakore and then she cooks them and then she sells them during the day. And then at the end of the day, she gets back uh, whatever money she gets back, she repays the loan out of that, right? So today she has to borrow at a very high interest rate. But now since we have the consent architecture and since already she's probably collecting a large part of her, um, large part of her uh, profits or, or revenues from the using some UPI app like Beam or PhonePay or Google Pay. So what she can do is she can share her financial transaction data with a credit provider and then the credit provider can analyze it and see, okay, she makes, she makes a uh, thousand rupees a day, let's say, right. Overall uh, revenue. So if I give her maybe 2000, she might be able to make a little more than 2000 and she might be able to repay a micro loan at the end of the day with maybe 2010 rupees. Right. And I've made 10 rupees right then and there. So that kind of a thing where you can start giving micro loans. Now, remember now here, there are no manual steps involved. Uh, everything is automated, no PDF parsing, no logging into a mobile website, uh, no logging into a internet or banking website. And this is very easy for Rajni to use, just a press of a button. Okay, and this is what it looks like. Customer permits the app to collect transaction data. 
each UPI transaction is recorded and records are analyzed to build a credit profile. And then the loan is offered based on the cash flow. Very simple, but very, very powerful, uh, addressing a huge, huge um, need in, in the market. And you can extend that a little further. You can say, okay, if you have a mutual fund, maybe give me access to your mutual funds as well. If you have insurance cover, let me give, give me access to that. If you have a pension fund, give me access to that. The more information you give me, the better loan I can give you or the better rate of interest I can give you, right? So we can progressively then keep adding more and more things into this kind of a uh, platform uh, so that the more data you get, the better credit worthiness you can establish, okay? Uh, but at the heart of this is the credit scoring algorithm that you need. Uh, and that is where you would have to then go back and do some research that if you have done some work in machine learning, you would have to maybe read some papers and figure it out. Uh, here is where I would start. So the first thing is uh, there is a report on credit scoring by CGAP. So this is, this is just like, how do you, how do you do? So credit scoring in financial inclusion basically says people who are unbanked or people who are underbanked or maybe are not part of the financial form. Uh, form financial system how do you score their uh, uh, how do you give them a credit score right and then this goes into a lot of depth into the methodology of how do you collect data and how do you uh, analyze data and what kind of systems do you need uh, but probably the interesting things that you can check out here are the scoring model development and then evaluating a scoring model and using the scoring model right so you can just uh, maybe even check out a case study because the first three parts are pretty much solved for you by the account aggregator platform itself right so you can check these out there's about 10 pages that you might want to read. Um, then, you know, just, just to get a sense of how are people doing it in other domains. Uh, so there are a couple of notebooks that I found on Kaggle. So this was on uh, just giving people credit based on their previous credit information. So you can see how to process the data, how to load the data, how to analyze it, what kind of a model to build. Um, now the data that you work with may not exactly be this. You may have to generate fake data or may you may or maybe you can just like put your uh, your credit card data as a credit data and your actual transaction data or repayment data as the um, sort of the repayment information right and build a model on that to decide your credit limit so this is one another one is uh, this this was about uh, cre credit default risk on home loans uh, this is also an interesting one to check out and uh, all of these you just need to know some basic Python programming, something like uh, NumPy, Pandas have linked to some tutorials and then maybe uh, a machine learning framework like scikit-learn, uh, even those are very easy to use. So again, you can just take an introductory tutorial on one of these and get started. Finally, I've also linked to a, a, a paper, a sort of a meta post about fifth, more than 50 papers on the application of machine learning in credit lending. Um, so here are all the papers that are linked here. So you can just go through all of these papers, roughly speaking, just, just basically uh, see what they're talking about, what kind of approaches they're applying and pick a simple approach and just show an end to end flow on this. Okay. So that's your credit modeling based on financial data. So those are the three use cases. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about how to create a winning project, right? So now you've done all this hard work, you've identified a problem, you are, you've identified how you're going to solve it. Um, but you know, as the deadline approaches, there are certain things that you need to make sure that you are doing to, to, to make sure that people understand what you've built and uh, they can actually see uh, what, are the, what are all the interesting things you've done, right? And this is something that I find a lot of people often miss. Uh, why should you listen to me? Uh, well, don't mean to brag, but uh, before I started uh, Jovin, uh, Jovin.ml, I was, uh, I, I participated in a bunch of hackathons for about a year, year and a half. My co-founder and I, we actually went around doing hackathons all over India and we won or ended up like as a runner up in many of them. So that kind of gave us an idea of what it takes to actually win a uh, hackathon, right? The, what, the solution that you develop is important, but there are a lot of other things that's, that you need to really convey what you've built to the jury and to the community in general, right? So I just want to leave you with some tips on that. So the first thing is to pick a good problem statement. The, the most important thing probably is to address a large and a very obvious use case, right? Something that the jury can understand, something that everybody can understand, even if it is a complex, see your solution may be complex. Your solution may have many moving pieces, but the need that it solves should be obvious because then it will be obvious to the jury. Then it will be obvious to your customers. Then it will be obvious to 
uh, anybody who's uh, reading about your um, uh, who's who's checking out your solution right uh, your 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 pitch should be a one line pitch that what is the problem that you're solving then it's very important to document your motivation and your objectives like what are you trying to solve before you get into the solution just say okay this is the problem and this is why i care about it because maybe it affects a large number of people or it affects me personally or uh, you know it's just something that needs to be done that it's very interesting and it was you know it is only now it is possible it was never possible before and what are your objectives that once once you've built out your solution what will the world look like right um one good way to then start building your solution is to start identifying gaps in existing solutions because that gives you a very clear idea of what you can do and what you can't do because when you look at an existing solution then you might see okay today they are doing it this way but now the ag- account aggregator comes along and now i don't need 80% of this and i can just plug this gap with a simple api request right or the, with a simple uh, consent architecture so identify gaps in existing solutions and finally focus not so much on the features because we often think of uh, as developers we start thinking okay i can do this and i can do that and i can do that but focus on the benefit rather than the features right so so look at the user the end user which is let's say rajni or you or uh, uh, a banker and focus on what is the benefit they are going to get what are the things they really care about and pick maybe just one or two features right you don't have a lot of time so just pick one or two features and work from there then uh, a, a a good way to actually build your solution is to actually start with the user experience and build backwards this is something a lot of people do the other way where uh, they first read all the api documentation and then they start building uh, the back end and they start building the apis and then there are a lot of these errors that need to be fixed and then there are so many bugs uh, and suddenly you're at the last stage and you have not started building the ui and then the ui is very much an afterthought where you're simply just putting in okay if you click a button then some json shows up on the screen do not do that start with the user experience so identify what are the core user flows and outcomes right and that's why we said benefits because now when you've identified the benefits build a flow so that the user can achieve that benefit identify core use case, user flows identify outcomes uh, create ui screens and mockups and flows before you do the actual implementation right because you have to really understand that uh, nobody is going to read your code uh nobody is going to look at a json and try to figure out what it means i mean people are evaluating hundreds of projects but everybody can see a ui and a nice designed ui and understand what it does okay and then what once you have a ui uh, a, a screen let's say mocked up then create an end to end flow with mock data right mock all the apis mock all the databases mock all the authentication remove everything just create a end to end mock flow something that you can run on on your browser or on your phone you can click 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 and show what uh, and just feel the experience of it and then start implementing each piece part by part right and one thing again probably a lot of people don't uh, uh, know is that you do not have to implement the entire thing for the hackathon right your hackathon is more of a concept proposal with proof and it's a proof of concept that this can actually be done right so so whichever pieces you can actually fill by actually uh, connecting with the sandbox or doing things like that you can fill those things in and the pieces that you are not able to fill just just mock them out right you do not need a proper authentication system a google login within your app to do that it's good that you can if you can implement it but you should not be spending the first week figuring out uh, google auth okay and then finally uh, it comes to the presentation so when you are presenting i would this is the rec- order that i would recommend first explain the problem the scale of the problem and your motivation behind solving it and your objective right so it's very important to set the context so that when somebody is checking out your solution they know okay ah uh, uh, i understand he is trying to give rajni a daily loan or okay he is trying to give a financial uh, uh, information app for me or okay this is a app app created for a banker right um while giving a loan then show a demo of the ui a uh, demo video of the ui ux so just show the flows even if it is with mock ups no problem just show a demo because once somebody sees it they really understand it and there's no better way to explain it you can write paragraphs and paragraphs but the best way is to just show a quick demo and within a minute they know what's going on and what you're trying to build then you go in and then you talk about the technical architecture and now here is where we get to geek out where we get to say okay look look at all these lines connecting with each other and all these flows 
uh, that's good but the technical architecture only makes sense once you've talked about what you are trying to build right and you've shown a demo of what the end user experience looks like and then in the technical architecture you want to showcase that you've understood the platform you know you've put the right connections in place and maybe you've mocked a few things that's all right you can do it you just need more time and finally you include your plans and ideas for future work again very important you want to say not just that okay this is what i've done and this is what you can do with it but this is what this could become right and and you will find that it's not this will and once you leave it for people's imagination when you give it to them in this format people can then extrapolate and they can see they can see the promise in what you are building right so just this is just a, probably the last 10% of effort that you need to put in into your uh, uh, project but please make sure to do this and i guarantee you you will get a much better response and you will get a much better feedback on what you've built okay so that's all i have um and i just want to wish you all all the best i know hackathons can be grueling especially when they go on for weeks um it takes a lot of hours of work so uh, i just want to wish you all all the best and i have uh, time to take some questions so maybe we can start taking some questions now awesome thank you akash that was great i mean i am just smiling because it was a super presentation and of course you gave very actionable insights about uh, how to you know not just uh work some data science and ml into uh, the account aggregator but also how to select projects how to execute in a hackathon i think all very relevant and very useful before we get into questions i want to just reiterate uh, to the audience that yes akash is completely right you don't need every single piece of the hackathon project we built out uh, we would like you to use the sandboxes if there is some gap for example the sandboxes only support a few types of data so some of the sandboxes support Mutual funds, GST, bank statements, but you may find that you know there's no access to insurance policies, for example. You can mock it up, mock up the data, store it locally, right? Just do something like that. Um, also, in the resources in the Hack Bible, we've included a couple of these open source tools which you can use to generate CSVs. So basically, uh, there's a tool which converts an SBI bank statement. If you download in CSV format, uh, it you know can convert it into a uh, DEPA compliant JSON. and the same can be done for mutual fund statements as well so check out these resources if you want to generate lots of fake data the sandboxes do have a fair amount of fake data you can also put you know it's preloaded you can also put your own data into the sandbox and to generate fake data you can use tools like there's this uh, node package called faker so what you'd have to do in faker is basically just provide one uh, example of what this xml object would look like which has you know the, the schema as defined by rabbit and then just write a for loop and faker will populate like n number of you know new objects with uh, random fake uh, data so you know you can do it so do check that out i put the link in the chat as well to faker and check out the hack bible as i said so akash thank you so much let's ask some questions and get into questions yep so maybe you could start with the most upvoted ones first sure so okay All right. So, if I were to be a middleware provider, how would I access the user's data without being an FIU? How do I provide it in the prescribed format to the FIU since it is encrypted? So, this one I okay. think Akash uh, Mahesh has actually answered it in the chat. So, I see okay. that Mahesh written, Ankur, you would be a technical service provider. The FIU would collect the data, and your solution would have access to the data. So, Mahesh is the co-founder of Samati, and uh, yes, this question I think you know he he's well placed to to answer that. uh okay the market is answered perfect uh, okay then the next question i see is can we keep the ml ai as a standalone code and use a virtual data room to connect with the fi okay oh, i'm not sure what you mean by virtual data room exactly okay. context for, for on this one akash one of the uh, special interest topics for the hackathon is, is something we want people to work on is this idea of a virtual data room where in um you know let's say you have some data i have some code in this case a machine learning model and we're interested in seeing you know whether you are eligible for a loan or something like that but i don't want you to see my algorithm and you don't want me to see your your data so okay. can we engineer it in such a way that you know my code can run on your data and then only the insight gets shared to both of us while we preserve the sort of privacy of our ip all right all right Yeah, I think you can absolutely do that. Uh, so, what you would probably need at that point is that rather than giving your data to the, let's say, okay, let's 
take a concrete example you have an account at sbi and you go to hdfc and you want to get a loan from hdfc right now you do not want to give your entire account information to hdfc so rather you want hdfc to give to to be able to process your data but not see your data right so the idea there is that you would then instead of sending your data directly to hdfc you would send it to a third like a sort of a, a middle fiu so your data would go to some trusted fiu somebody you trust and then hdfc would probably send some like a let's say let's say a python file just for the sake of it it can be a little more structured but just a python file so hdfc sends a python file with some code now this fiu takes that data converts it to whatever csv the python needs and then the python file is executed on the on the data and then the result is then sent back to all parties to which is to the customer and to the and to hdfc right so this can absolutely be done uh, it's just that you need like a third fiu in between so do you think that makes sense ariman uh yeah i think you know it's it's a bit of a that's one of the reasons why it's a special interest topic in the hackathon is that there's many different ways that one could go about it and we're interested to see the different solutions that people come up with and as you say this is this is one you know having a trusted fiu as an intermediary uh, of yep. course we had a bunch of business implications around that and it's something worth exploring for sure i think there's no yep. you know clear answer right now so that's why it's uh, it's such an exciting topic makes sense yeah okay then there's a question how will you differentiate models given it's the same end to end flow and the data is false um okay so i think this question is mainly about if you're doing some kind of a credit modeling uh, what does the end to end uh, and if you built out a model what is like the end to end flow is going to be the same how does it matter what model you have created well what you can do is take some first try and find a good data source there are actually a lot of great data sources available online um especially financial data so try and find a, a real data source uh, if possible or try to compile it just be- between you and your family a lot of models don't even need more than a few hundred rows of data to work with right so you have probably from four or five accounts uh, you have probably a thousand uh, transactions and then all of your family would have another uh, thousand each then that will give you around 10000 transactions now on the 10000 transactions you can actually build a bunch of different models you can use let's say uh, some kind of a linear regression you can use some kind of a random forest you can use some neural networks um whatever like gbm etc and then what you would probably want to do is you would then want to present your findings um where you show okay these were the approaches that were tried and these were the results that we got that it seems like the uh, random forest seems to give the best results when we are trying to predict a credit score right or it seems like the neural network gives the best result when we are trying to predict uh, the insurance premium all right so or even something as simple as whether this person will default or not based on the data that they have given us so yeah that's what that's what i would suggest try to get as close to real data as possible and uh, yeah that's what uh, uh, akash just mentioned a number of different techniques and algorithms uh for those of you who are interested in learning more and kind of you know akash does these amazing very hands on tutorials about all of these different techniques so i believe they're available on the jovian website akash or where can you find them um yeah so we we do a lot of uh, tutorials on data science and machine learning and actually we have a a course coming up <laughs> good that you mentioned that uh, aryaman so we actually have an upcoming course uh, starting in august uh, this is a data analysis with python uh, course it starts from basic programming covers numpy pandas and then we have another course on machine learning that's already available on our youtube channel so if you just search uh, youtube.com/jovianml you will find some tutorials there as well um but yeah thanks ariman for mentioning that yeah sure i mean it's a great place to learn i've learned stuff watching those so i mean i'm sure people uh, in the audience will will definitely learn a lot Okay maybe we can take a couple more questions then i can see okay the general question the acquisition training and inference costs has there been a baseline okay i'm not sure what this means acquisition training and inference costs i think if you're trying to say that what should be like a good baseline for your models um in terms of uh, the 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 accuracies that you want to reach maybe you can just you know before any time before you train a model you, what you might want to do is just look through the data yourself and make a few decisions so maybe look through somebody's bank statement and 
just you decide whether they are credit worthy or not all right are they taking too many loans or are they taking too many uh, are they actually spending and saving uh, being conservative with their spending uh, and then that gives you a baseline for your training then the second question was about cost i think so as such there is a very low cost to all of this since we are doing, dealing with text data we are dealing with a few thousand tens of thousands of rows uh, there is a very low cost to uh, processing these the real cost comes into collecting or acquisition of this data which earlier used to be done manually um, but now with the account aggregator it's simply a click of a button on the customer's end right and you get everything in a nice json format just to kind of jump in for a second i really liked you know we've spoken a lot about different applications for data science and machine learning as well as resources to learn more but one thing i liked a lot in in the middleware theme was actually the data warehouse i think that that could be a very cool idea right because as you said a lot of data will become available thanks to this account aggregator framework and yep. the fius need to you know properly store that data so one aspect of that storage is definitely security and data governance which is an entirely you know it's a separate special interest topic for this hackathon but uh, data warehousing is you know also very important right like being able to efficiently manage that data and uh, building middleware for that management of data is actually something which is often overlooked in favor of maybe you know security and uh, governance related things absolutely absolutely and especially with the like the traditional enterprises or banks you need to really uh, one is there are a lot of compliances that you need to meet so it's not an easy problem right and second you also need to make it really easy to use i mean it cannot be now it should not be a very technologically heavy solution uh, it should be very simple to give people permission remove people set groups an entire like set up a two factor authentication and things like that so i think there's a huge opportunity there there's going to be a terabytes of data which is just going to become suddenly digitized because of the account aggregator i and it, honestly if i were probably looking to start a company in the fintech domain i would probably uh, look in that direction myself Awesome! Super, super exciting stuff. So I okay. think there's one one question which is a meta kind of question. Will we get the links to the resources uh, in the slides? So mm -hmm. yeah, I believe so, right? Akash, if you share with me, I can make sure everybody gets a uh, hold of the presentation. Yeah. So I think the whole presentation is on SlideShare. So I will just pass on the link and let me just post it here as well. Let me find it. So while we do that just some housekeeping if you are working on the hackathon and uh, you know you and your team have an idea please do reach out to me i'm on the slack i would like to understand you know what the teams are building so i can help you guys get in touch with the right mentors get access to the right resources clear any blockers that you may have so please have somebody from your team just message me on slack to let me know you know what you guys are building and what you need so that uh, i can help you make the best possible presentation Uh, also, you know, next week we'll be having on the weekend we have some presentations, but also during the week we may have some. So, you know, please stay tuned. I will send emails. I'll send messages on Slack. Um, but do stay tuned. So, uh, do I post it in the chat? Uh, yeah, you could. I mean, I don't think there's much persistence in the chat uh, beyond here. Right. I'll just I'll make sure you repost it. Uh, you know, on, on the Slack sure. channel. Cool. Um, all right. I think that's so. I guess that's pretty much it I, that I have from my end. And also, just want to say a big thank you to Ariman. I've been seeing Ariman conducting all of these sessions nonstop for the last couple of weeks. So please do give Ariman a round of applause as well. Thank you. You're too kind. I think the credit is all you know to our amazing speakers and audience because you guys have come together to learn and to share knowledge. So it's really good to see. And uh, yeah, hopefully you know you you come back during the final presentations and you see some things you really like. For sure, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, everybody, and thank you very much to Akash. All right. Thanks, Ariman. Thanks, everyone, and all the best. Bye, everybody. See you.